Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. First, I've got my live guest for tonight, uh, Kyle Kutazi, who's a board member of the HR Nickel Society, an organisation dedicated to the deregulation of the labour market and upholding the rule of law in the employment uh, sector. So, Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, at the moment in Australian uh, politics, the, the Liberal Party has, has always tried to uh, tame the, the influence of the trade union movement. The Labor Party is, well, it's affiliated with the trade union movement. It's 50-50 that the Labor Party get, well, members get 50% of the vote in the actual, their party and the unions get 50%. So there's a very clear divide in terms of unions and workplace relations in Australian politics. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's right. Um, <clears throat> do you want to talk about why the Labor Party is that way? Or Yeah, um, yeah. Um, we'll start we'll start from there. Okay, well, um, it's, very, it's a very interesting background, actually. Um, and it has relevance to things that are going on in the world today in um, in, in demographic and social movements. Um, it's, it's not very well known that Australia in the late 19th century um, had uh, a very large male dominated population. So there was a lot of men, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, who were coming to Australia. Australia at the time, you might know the late 19th century, early 20th century was the richest uh, country in the world per capita. Uh, there was a lot of opportunities here uh, at a time when the world economy was largely still agricultural and uh, Australia, obviously, given the large land space and, and mass that we have, that is very suited to agricultural uh, production. And um, uh, there's a lot of men in the UK who came here looking for their fortunes. And when you do that, and you've got to shell out a lot of money to get on a boat to, to come here, um, it's not as cheap comparatively as, uh, as it is today to, to get on a ship. Um, those men would come here often single or they'd leave their spouses behind. Um, and so you, you had a very, uh, you had a, a mix match where, where there were more men, significantly more men in Australia than there were women. And what happens in those circumstances uh, is those men effectively live a life of, uh, of uh, celibacy. Um, they form uh, men's communities. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of organisations formed in the late 19th century. Um, all around the world, but particularly in Australia, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, the union movement became so strong in Australia was they were collections of men's groups basically getting together and saying, well, what do we do? And in that era, there was a lot of shearers. Um, and that's where the first union started was the was the shearers union, which later today has morphed into the Australian Workers Union. Um, so you had a large number of men who had uh, who were very organised, getting together on a regular basis having a beer, having a chat, and they were saying, what do we do with ourselves? Well, let's, you know, let's go and strike demand, you know, better wages and that kind of thing. And and from that, um, from the from the union movement grew the desire to have political representation, and that's where the Australian Labor Party came from, uh, by and large. Um, it's a very long answer to a, to a short story, but that, that's how we came to have... The, the Labor Party is, a, is a, a traditionally and officially still uh, the political arm of the trade union movement which is a, um, a very ironic um, or perhaps uh, anachronistic is probably a better word um, uh, uh, feature of it, given that by and large, when we think of um, the Australian Labor Party and the union movements today, um, we see a connection, but we don't really see the Labor Party representing the interests of workers anymore. And by the way, trade union movements don't really uh, represent the, the interests of workers anymore in Australia either, given that their membership in the private sector is is so significantly low. Now, yeah, you talked about that. Obviously, it was the the union movement was heavily male uh, dominated, and I can even tell this uh, from the the modern uh, uh, day that it's also it's union industry is more Celtic than than Anglo. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, Australian trade union leaders have had a uh, Scottish accent and very, you'd say, uh, masculine. And well, that's because it is, well, working class industrial jobs used to be 
it, it, it used to be only only conducted by by men and so that's why there, there was this uh, basically brotherhood in the the union uh, mm. movement and obviously like men to the the way back in those days they they used to you know, make, make sure that they got the the outcome that they wanted was to use macho or i wouldn't say aggressive but uh, uh, stern uh tactics yeah it's interesting you've noticed that the um the you've noticed the celtic uh as opposed to anglo mix uh, maybe it's the unions i'm dealing with um uh, i i do notice uh, just as many anglos or, or or other nationalities as well who work as union officials um if if there is a if there is if that is a feature of the modern union movement it, it may say, say something to the background um of those people whether it's the rebellious streak that comes from you know irish nationalism or scottish nationalism or, or something along those lines maybe that has something to do with it uh, i don't know it's not something i have to be honest i've noticed all that uh, all that much um i certainly know a lot of uh, australian and english um union officials now the the villain or bad boy, I think, is is probably a, a, a too endearing term of the trade union movement at the moment. Has been John Secker, who is the still the Victorian Secretary of the CFMMEU, which is the cons, cons, Construction, Forestry, Mining, Maritime, Energy Union, which it's it used to be the CFMEU. Uh, and they've merged with the the Maritime Union of Australia, which they're most famous for the the waterfront dispute when they got uh, locked out by Patrick Corporation because they basically refused to increase their poor product productivity. And so they've uh, these two militant aggressive unions are now this big one super union, and he's the the guy in charge of the Victorian division now. And have you noticed um, the two industries? It's funny those two came together. Uh, what are, when you think about things in, in Australian life that you can outsource or offshore, Tim, what are the two things that are just impossible to offshore? You can't offshore building and you can't offshore um, dock work. It's the, it's the only things you cannot take anywhere else. You can send manufacturing overseas. You can send back office work overseas. You can even go overseas to do your health care. Um, uh, you can have just about anything done overseas, but you can't get building done elsewhere and you can't get things off the ports elsewhere. So what, what you've got there in those two unions now combined into one is, is a captive audience where because the, the industrial relations system will not allow the punishment of, of uh, law breaking, um, they can get away with playing to the crowd um, and they play it up and they know that they can be as militant as they like because nothing's going to come of it. Uh, so yeah, they, they play to the crowd. They know that when, they, when, they, when they're going the militant route, their, their membership is not, is not going, well, when, look, there's no, there's no real democracy in, union, in unions anyway, but uh, even if there was, um, uh, playing it up gets attention and that's what these guys need in order to, to, to justify their position. Uh, it, it's in the it's it's in the officials interest in those unions to to play the militant role um there's no reason for them not to do so um uh, the, the 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 if they if they go soft then someone more militant will come along and and basically jackknife them out of the job and that's what these guys are they're jobs for them um they're more than just jobs for them they're lifestyles when i uh when i worked in perth for a period of time um the uh there was a there was a building uh, it was built at the raffles, um, for those who are Western Australians, they would know the raffles quite well at Apple Cross. And that was a, one of the few buildings in, in Perth that never had any industrial disputation because the, um, the CFMEU um, secretary at the time was given the penthouse suite on the top floor in return for that. Um, everything went smoothly on that on that building job. So it's about personal enrichment for, for um, union officials, really. That's why they're there um, and they don't want to lose their jobs. Now, John Secker, he's got a large criminal rap, rap sheet. He actually went to prison in the early 1990s, uh, the old infamous Pentridge prison in Melbourne, which has been closed down now. 
there's a Australian Financial Review article which uh, lists that he's been charged with uh, 60 uh, crimes over over his uh, union career. Uh, now, his justification for this always is is that if I'm not a tough bastard, then I don't do the right thing by my members. There's a reason why they're the uh, some of the the highest paid workers in the nation because I get them. A good, a good deal, but as you've just described there, that it's it's pretty much in these industries a, a racket that they're basically earning what we would consider an executive salary. Yeah, when you're saying the, the executive salary, are you referring to the builders or you're referring to the union officials? Uh, both. Oh, look, they're, they're on, on, on unionized building sites, there are definitely some uh, very unskilled people earning an awfully large amount of money. Um, but yeah, the union officials by and large make more than everyone. Uh, the, the, head, uh, the, the, the secretaries of most of the, um, the mills and trade unions in Australia are, are multi-millionaires, but um, they would never have their members uh, know that. They, that's a secret they, they keep well and truly hidden from them. Um, they, they talk the... Uh, uh, the language of class struggle and and you know workers united will never be defeated um but uh the, the reality of, of how they live is very different their slogan has always been workers united will never be defeated and the trade union movement that it's they've always had the attitude of touch one touch all they even when there's been foul conduct by uh, union officials or unionized workers it's always been excused by pe people like um uh, she's the the new member for i i, I forget it I forget her name the, the the former uh president of the the actu now she's the she's in parliament now her name's escaped uh, me. Uh, there's a few of them um sharon burrows george jenny uh sorry jenny george um uh what's the Who's the other one? Who's the one that the moment the one at the moment looks like a man? What's the name? Sally um, McManus. She's the secretary. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, she's not in Parliament yet, is she? No. Um, no, but soon to be. Everyone, everyone who's ever worked for the ACTU ends up in Parliament um, in some way, shape, or form. Um, some less successful than others. I'm just looking yeah. it up now. Oh, Jed Carney. I was close. Oh yes, that's it, Jed Carney. Yeah. Yes, he used to go shoe shopping in uh in um in uh geneva with uh with uh what was her name julie bishop they used to go to the uh ilo conventions and go shoe shopping together yeah that's right oh well, that's a fun fact yeah well i remember the reason why i raised her name jed Carney is because she excused there was some um, in rural queensland some mining workers who had been locked out in an industrial dispute and made rape threats against uh employees oh, yeah. of the company even against their children and she excused <laughs> that because they're being tortured basically that's what she claimed oh, it's one of the great um dichotomies and, and balancing acts that the modern union movement tries to to balance is that uh the old style traditional militant union is actually quite chauvinistic um sexist racist uh in fact don't forget that the original wise Australia policy came from um, the Australian Labor Party because they wanted to keep uh, people out who were going to take jobs of, of, the, of the workers, so-called. So, -called. so um, that, that's still very strongly there. And those guys don't, don't have a problem at all um, telling women they're gonna rape them or bash them or, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I, I know a guy uh, who worked on a building site who was giving the union a hard time. So they went and kidnapped his kids from school one day. Huh. And they rang him. Yeah, they said if you want to see your kids again, um, you better play ball. And uh, and he, he you know, he's he's quick witted and and sharp. And he just immediately said, keep the bastards. Um, and five minutes later, uh, the kids got dropped back outside of school. So this is the thing with with Middleton trade unions. There are a lot of talk that um, and there are there are incidents where they go too far. And and again, this is something else I was going to touch on is um, the way in which their behaviour. Uh, is by and large ignored by the media. You, yes, look, John Seck is in the media at the moment, but I mean, Tim, did you know that a guy lost his eye on the um, on the Patrick Stevedore industry 20 years ago? They 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 they, uh, they sat above um, the uh, you know I don't know if you know Sydney at all where the docks used to be, which is now Barangaroo. 
there's a guy, quite a large, steep escarpment. One guy sat up there above the escarpment with a bow and arrow, and anyone across the picket line, he shot a bow and arrow at them. One hit the guy straight through the eye and blinded him. That, that, nothing came of it. Nothing came of it. And, you know, and didn't get any attention in the media. Um, the union was never fined over it. Um, no, they, they didn't care. That's barbaric. And, well, that was in 1998, before the yeah. internet and smartphones could capture things. So it, it's basically been able to be hidden from history. I mean, you're certainly not going to be able to find that out by a Google search or on the Wikipedia page of the, the waterfront uh, dispute. It's just it's just going to be something that's covered up. Oh, but there's a lot more examples than, than just that. And um, I, I could tell you lots of examples of things that go on in, building, in the building industry. Um, not just in Melbourne, by the way. Melbourne's just the most egregious example of it, but all around the country. If you if you piss a union off on a on a big building site anywhere where the union's involved in it, I mean, they they have basically have gangsters who are um, uh, occasionally end up getting jobs as uh, lift operators or crane drivers or whatever. And mate, you try and work on a building site without without being able to get access to a crane or a lift, you can't do anything. And well, you turn up and the the crane operator just says. No, nah, mate, you're not on the list. Um, uh, I'm not moving your stuff for you. Um, and what are you going to do about it? Right? You know, seriously, if you're there and you're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a day because the crane won't take your stuff, um, what are you going to do about it? Call the cops? Cops aren't going to do anything. What are you going to do? Sue the builder? Builder's going to say, oh, well, mate, it's just, you know, timetable didn't work out. Um, couldn't get the crane driver to move it at the time you wanted it. You know, so bad, too bad. Um, you know, you get you, you die by a death by a thousand cuts. You know, you lose an hour here, you lose two hours there, you lose a day there. Um, before you know it, you've you've racked up two million dollars worth of losses on a building project. It's not worth the it's not worth the fight. So you everyone just rolls over. And uh, now, what you've described, it seems that the the trade union movement has been uh, what uh, what the feminists call a hotbed of toxic uh, masculinity. But now the 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 culture of the union movement is clashing with the the woke uh, social justice culture yeah, and yeah. and that's what's led to john secker's downfall not this huge uh, criminal history or, or he's just as we've said he's just one of many of uh, uh, union officials who've been engaged in appalling conduct but it was reported comments that he made about uh rosie batty who's one of the anti-domestic violence uh campaigners that she'd uh, put uh, men's uh, rights back and that he was uh, before the courts for uh, using a carriage service to harass and menace a woman who we later learned after he was convicted and put on a good behavior bond that it was his wife uh, Emma Walters who's an industrial uh, lawyer herself. Mm. Well, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll be clear about it. I'm not a fan of Rosie Batty either. Um, um, but leave that aside for a moment. It's it, it's never it's never on, no matter whether you agree with someone or don't agree with someone, to um, you know to send them abusive messages or call them at two o'clock in the morning, breathe heavily down the phone or whatever it is that John Secker does to people um, or allegedly does to people. Uh, you know um, that's never on. I, I completely accept that. And but it, but look, as I said to you before, um, these unions are a war unto themselves. No one's going to stop them. Yeah, mate, it, 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 why is it that you don't go out there? And, and, you know, ring my wife at two o'clock in the morning and, and threaten to come over and rape her. Why is that, Tim? Because you know that the cops are going to come and arrest you, right? Are the cops going to arrest anyone for, for picketing a building site? Are the cops going to arrest anyone for, for smearing someone's, you know, gang boxes in butter so it destroys their equipment? Is anyone going to do anything? Are the cops going to do anything about that? No. They just throw their hands up in the air and say, oh, this is a civil dispute. This doesn't involve us, right? So until you, until you actually enforce the law, on building sites in Australia, this sort of behaviour will continue to go on. Um, that's a, it's a simple reality. Well, not much is going to be done at the state level in Victoria, which is where John Secker is based, because Daniel Andrews is the is the premier. He's basically he was able to to get all of not just the the, the construction and all those industrial, but the the paramedics, the firefighters, all that on board. He got the coalition of union interest together to getting himself elected in in 2014 and uh last year he got the the city uh shut down so his his union buddies could could hold one of their uh, uh their huge uh rallies and he, he that, marched with them but how is that any different to what ted bale you did how is that any different to uh you know john um uh, jeff kennett before that 
I mean, you know, uh, liberal governments don't give you anything different, really. They don't. They're too scared to take on the union movement. Uh, I, I lived in Perth at the time where, where Te uh, um, Colin Barnett rolled over a month before an election and gave a, something like a 20% pay rise to the teachers union because they were threatening to go on strike. Uh, fine, let them go on strike. Uh, you know, it, well, <laughs> well, what do you say? Well, liberal governments don't give you any better. I probably didn't make that point well. I, I probably should have said that Daniel Andrews gives them basically everything that he possibly can. He goes that extra mile. That's probably how sure, I should have. Sure. <laughs> okay, but, fair call. Fair yeah, call. but the the federal coalition governments they've tried to do a bit over the years uh, to curb uh, union power and and thuggery because. Uh, John Howard, uh, he he for years had uh, believed in labour market deregulation, and yep. when uh, well before he got control of the Senate in two thousand and five, he introduced the Australian Building and Construction uh, Commission, which came out of a Royal Commission, the Coal Royal Commission, into of union misconduct in the building industry, and that was very effective in getting stoppage times down on on building sites and getting product productivity up which was abolished, it was abolished by the Rudd government, even though Rudd said he wasn't a union man and kicked out Joe McDonald because he was a union thug. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that. Um, um, and, and you're right, Rudd, Rudd was part of the new age, the more modern what we see of Labor today, which is basically a soft version of the Greens. Um, and it doesn't particularly have any, uh, any love for um, uh, union militancy. Uh, the unions are, are just, you know, the hired goons when they need, uh, uh, when they need people to letterbox during elections, that that's true. That much is true. But um, uh, he had to uh, he had to pay off his his support base. Um, uh, the union movement did a lot to get Kevin Rudd elected in two thousand and seven. Uh, they wanted the abolition of um, of work choices. We can have a conversation about work choices. Um, where at HR Nichols were not necessarily fully supportive of our work choices for different reasons though. Um, but uh, they they wanted to get rid of that. And they also want to get rid of the ABCC, and they did. That's the two first things that that the Rudd government did when they got elected was put forward bills to abolish both of those pieces of legislation. Um, but uh, look, it came back under under Tony Abbott. Keep in mind, but um, the, look, the federal government is limited. At the end of the day, um, policing is a is a state government issue. Um, the federal government does have a lot of, of sway through its ability to award contracts. To, um, to builders who comply. So they've used what's called, um, they call it code compliance. So what they've done is they've issued, uh, back way back in 2004, they issued a thing called the um, uh, this, uh, Australian Building uh, Code. And anyone who doesn't comply with the code cannot tender for, not just win, but cannot tender for federal government uh, work. And that automatically covers the vast majority of uh, major builders because there's very little federal government. And by the way, it doesn't have to be 100% federal government work. It can be federal government only chips in 1% of the, of, the, of the total and it automatically is covered by the code. So that has had an impact. Um, I'm not gonna dispute that, it has had an impact, but it, it can't go all the way. And, and if the job doesn't involve um, the federal government code in any way, shape or form, then you're back where you started from. And the unions are very, very clever at finding ways of getting around these things. The code is constantly changing. It's gone through literally hundreds of iterations because the union finds a new loophole and uh, the government has to close that loophole. Uh, so when Tony Abbott became uh, Prime Minister and the, the coalition, well, they're still in government uh, to this day, uh, they not only restored the, the ABC, CC, uh, but uh, they held a Royal Commission into uh, trade union misconduct and corruption, which it uh, revealed these sweetheart deals between uh, trade unions and big business. And Bill Shorten, who was opposition leader at the time when he was with the Australian Workers Union, uh, did this very uh, dodgy deal uh, with a company called Clean Event, and the uh, Australian Workers Union got as uh, some a, a kickback from that. Very common, very, very common. This is not a recent thing. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, the union movement learnt this from the trade unions in the United States. Um, in, the sta in the States, they call it payola. Um, we don't really use that term here. Um, but as you said, kickback is, is an equally um, relevant term. 
how I've mostly done it here is instead of direct bribery, where where um, a company just simply pays a cash amount to the to a union, what they do is they set up uh, entitlement funds. So uh, to use an example, um, uh, in the electrical industry in Victoria, there is a long a portable long service leave fund where um, all the employers, as a condition of signing a union agreement, they have to pay money into a into a fund which is managed by the union and ostensibly co-managed by the um, Electrical Contractors Association, but they're just a patsy to the union anyway. And and this is this fund, by the time, when you think about it, if you've got 10,000 employees in an industry uh, all having their annual leave paid into a fund uh, every single week, year on year, how many millions of dollars are sitting in that fund? Uh, and they just reinvest it in uh, where they want to reinvest it. If they earn their 8% on it, uh, what do you think they do with their with their eight percent? They just cut it up. They go on, um, they buy themselves Mercedes and go on, you know, holidays overseas, and it all disappears into uh, into their back pockets. And uh, there's very little disclosure about these things. And um, yeah, it's 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 really really dodgy. And in return for agreeing to these kind of arrangements, the employer, particularly big business employers, in and you've used an example there of clean clean event. Um, you see it a lot with the SDA and the supermarket chains, uh, Woolworths and Coles in particular. Uh, they can get uh, very, very, very suppressed wages in return for agreeing to all the union side demands. Um, so, so much for um, the unions looking after their members. Um, they're actually only looking after themselves. Yeah, because enterprise bargaining agreement, which the the unions negotiate with with big employers, they override the industrial awards, uh, which uh, are, ha are handed down by now the Fair Work Commission. I mean, is there still is. does the Australian Industrial Relations Commission, the original uh, body, does that exist anymore? No, Gillard abolished it, so she could sack. Um, all the commissioners that she didn't like, and she reappointed all the union officials that she liked as commissioners of the new Fair Work Commission. Yeah, so enterprise bargaining agreements, they, they can they, they can reduce workers' penalty rates, uh, a lot of other entitlements, uh, but it has to be the EBA signed off by the Fair Work Commission. And there used to be a thing called the no disadvantage test. Does that apply to yeah. EBAs? Yeah, so it's similar. It's now called the Better Off Overall Test, the boot. Uh, it's very similar, but there are some small differences to it. Um, but by and large, the practical reality is that if a union signs an EBA, the commission almost always passes it without any um, dispute whatsoever. But you try and do an EBA that doesn't involve the union. They haul you over the coals. They make you explain every single thing. Uh, they make you give undertakings. It's a very hard process. It's des deliberately designed to make you go, you know what, I might as well just go into a union EBA. And that, by the way, that's a system that's existed now since 2009. And Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull and now Scott Morrison have been in government for six years and have done nothing to change it. Sally McManus, uh, her campaign in the lead up to the federal election was the, the change the rules and, and uh, Bill Shorten also said your paycheck is, is not going up and this is what Sally McManus said as well. And But all of these, the wages were not going up because of these EBAs that the union negotiated it and it's sort of, I'm probably going to put a tinfoil hat on here that it almost sounds like this was deliberate by the union movement to... Uh, to elect a Labor government to negotiate these poor EBAs and so they could say to their uh, workers, oh, it's it's not us, it's the system. You need to vote for Labor uh, for us to fix it. Tim, um, I'm going to destroy your conspiracy theory here for a second mm. because there are so few employees in Australia, workers at all in Australia anymore, who are members of a union. Um, the, the, the amount of uh, influence that one or two or three big employer union agreements will have on the overall um, wages take home of, of, a, of the average Australian is almost is almost close to zero. If you if you stripped out public service employees, and by that I include um, former public uh, public service employees, uh, so you strip out people who worked at Qantas or the Commonwealth Bank or um, I'm trying to think Telstra for example. Uh, where there's still very strong unionised culture from the hangover from the from the public service days. Um, if you strip away all the public service and union movement in Australia, it's really down to something like four or five percent, um, and and often that's just because a person feels they 
they're obliged to do so. It's very, very, very small portion of the economy now. Yeah, you're correct that union membership is declining, but the reason why I made that uh, point or conspiracy theory is that it doesn't matter if you're a part of a big company, whether you're a union member or not, you're still uh, bound by the EBA. The, the, uh, the, the EBA, yeah, co yeah, EBA covers both union and non-union workers, so whether you pay your union dues or not, you're, you're still stuck with the union deal. That's right, that's right, yep. Yeah. And yeah, uh, well, they do allow non-members to to vote, uh, but I always love how these votes are done. Is that they they count the the people who didn't vote as yes because th there was going to be that transport strike in in New South Wales, and they counted there was an overwhelming yes to strike because they counted the non-responses as yes. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether that's um, whether that's allowed. By the way. Um, uh, I'd have to have another look at the at the act. Um, it used to require um, a, a majority of those casting a vote to vote in favour of um, uh, taking strike action. Well, it was declared but, illegal in the end. The strike, the the one that I mentioned, the New South Wales uh, strike, uh, transport strike. But that was they, yeah. Roll in it. yeah. But but I made that point because that's sort of the the tactic that they sort of use to make sure that they get part of the tactics they use to get the the outcome in union elections they want. Well, keep in, keep in mind, before um, 2005, you didn't even need to have a secret ballot to, um, to take industrial action as a union. The, um, it could simply be declared uh, by them. And, you know, I knew many, many workers who didn't want to participate in industrial action who were basically intimidated into getting involved because if you didn't, you know, um, good luck to you, you know, we'll come and beat the shit out of you. We'll, we'll um, you know, sand you down, you, you will never get over time, whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of things you can do without resorting to physical violence where, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So you don't, if you're just an 18 year old apprentice in a workplace, you're not going to have that fight, you're just going to go along. Yeah, and this is why, yeah, well, especially big business, uh, they, well, they want to keep the unions off their, their back, but they also want to, these EBAs benefit them because it helps freeze out smaller uh, businesses because small businesses uh -huh. are still bound by the awards. They have to pay the Saturday and Sunday penalty rates. Obviously, Saturday penalty rates uh, are being uh, phased out, uh, but but it's it's a perfect cozy relationship to to freeze out the well, the the actual hard workers, which is the small business people, those who put in. 60 to 80 hours a week running a, running a small business and taking on a risk? Oh, um, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I, I can remember many, many uh, large electrical contractors who came to me when I was the secretary at the, at the Electrical Contract Association and used to say, geez, we really hark for the days where everyone was on the patent EBA, which meant patent EBA meant every single person had exactly the same uh, enterprise agreement across the entire state or anything and um and i used to say why do you want that and and the big guys would say well we have to pay so much more in wages and i said well yeah and well we can compete with the small guys on uh, on our economies of scale we can order our our cable much more cheaply because we're buying more of it um we can spread our fixed costs over a much larger number of employees um uh, you know, the one thing we can't compete with the with the small or the medium sized contractors is that um, they've got more flexible labour than we do. And I used to say, yeah, and they go, well, we want to stop that. We we want a level playing field. That's the, the phrase that the union movement likes to use: the level playing field. But the level playing field is just about um, is about squeezing small businesses. You're absolutely 100% spot on. And big business, it's it's been in the news. For the past few years, their their corporate re social responsibility uh, obligations that they've created for themselves, uh, and the most obvious example is they all joined the campaign to uh, legalize same-sex marriage, and they, and yeah. it's it's funny it's had the effect of making the uh, uh, the left uh, who normally hate big business basically love because Alan Jones recently attacked Coles for withdrawing their advertising. They're all like. All, all these people are saying, "Oh, I'm going to, you know, give all my money to Coles now to 
it, 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 it's quite it, it's quite strange just how they've they've learned to to love uh, big business and these two the big business and unions getting together for these EBAs and the 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 woke corporations now it's it's had the effect of the the Liberal Party seeming to go back to the the Menzian view of enterprise and Robert Menzies he founded the Liberal Party in 1944 because he wanted to protect the forgotten Australians from uh, big business and powerful uh, trade unions and that's uh, what uh, Scott Morrison's assistant minister uh, uh, Ben Morton said in a speech recently oh geez I I'd be a bit more uh, cynical that way from the Liberal Party it was uh he wanted to win office and uh, he had a number of rival parties on the right, so he united them all into the one party. Uh, I guess it's good to have a, uh, um, a catch cry that's non-party uh, non, um, political, but uh, yeah, yeah, The Forgotten People is one of his more famous, uh, one of his more famous speeches. Um, but when you say they're going back to a Menzian um, approach, what do you mean? Uh, are you trying to say the Liberal Party is... Is, is taking a view on industrial relations that's sort of positive, or are you saying it's going in the opposite direction? Uh, I'm not well, sure that it takes approach. It sounds hopeful, but you're, you've obviously been around a number of years. You're extremely uh, cynical and probably blackpilled on Liberal Party's ability to, to do things, but I, I'm, I'm just putting a positive spin that it's, it seems that the, the Liberal Party, they've, they've realised you know, big business is part of the elites now, and they're no different to what their traditional enemy, the the union movement. But we'll see how that manifests in this in this term of government. Obviously, yeah, quite rightly, you're you, you don't hold much hope. Oh, I, I don't dispute the Liberal Party's ability to do something about it if they wanted to, um, but there's no will. And if you've met ninety percent of Liberal Party politicians. You'll realise that they are the bottom of the of the of the barrel of, of all Australians. To be perfectly honest with you, now, the Labor guys aren't any better, by the way. I'm not I'm not trying to suggest that that that, that, that they are. Um, but you know, there's 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 a couple there that you know I'm I'm quite impressed by. But the vast majority of them, you know, you wouldn't employ them as a checkout chick. To be perfectly honest. Sorry. I, I said the vast majority of the, the politicians are, are hopeless um, on all sides. Yeah, oh, you, you've got that right. There, and there certainly is, if they had the will to, to do things, they, they could. I mean, other, oh, uh, uh, other leaders throughout history, or well, democratic leaders, have showed how it's done. Margaret Thatcher, she achieved a lot. Uh, Ruth Richardson in New Zealand, she, she was a finance minister from 1990 to 1993. She achieved so much in her three years with labour market deregulation it cost her her career in the end but she achieved so much in in three years what most politicians ach achieve in a lifetime and well, even though her career came to an abrupt end she's proud of the the legacy you don't get many politicians who say yeah i'd cut short my career in politics to do what is right and be a conviction politician and she was in labor too wasn't she Ruth Richardson, no, she was National Party, New Zealand MP. Okay. You're thinking okay. of um, uh, okay. Roger Roger Douglas, who was the finance minister. He, because he was Labor, he couldn't get away with labour market deregulation like that. He just began with just uh, just business deregulation and privatisation, not the labour force that came later. That was yeah, that was part of New Zealand's revolution from basically a a democratic socialist country in 1984 under uh, uh, Sir Robert Muldoon, who was basically, he was the National Party leader. He's what you'd call a national socialist. He wanted to freeze New Zealand in time to, to basically be this, uh, uh, this uh, statist uh, utopia. And it was completely changed in nine years by both Labour and national governments to be basically one of the freest economies uh, in the world. So yes, if there's a will by people like Roger Douglas and Ruth Richardson, it can be done. But then ironically, New Zealand's gone backwards. Yes. Um, uh, and I'm not saying in the last year, um, ever since um, uh, ever since that government's been going backwards. Ellen Clark, Key, um, who was that other, what was that other guy who was hopeless English, wasn't it? Now you got, now you got uh, Jacinda. Yes. Um, <laughs> but well, we've been the same. We've been going backwards since Howard. 
each one's been getting progressively worse than the other. Well, that's because the Liberal Party seems to be traumatised by losing the 2007 election, which they all believe was due to the work choices legislation, which was apparently the most radical uh, deregulation of the labour market uh, ever. But the way that I see it, my, my political... Can about choices? I, I, know, I know that HR and Nichols Society had a lot of problems with it, yes. In, in essence, all that that legislation did was 1,500 pages of it. All it really did in a practical sense was uh, essentially abolish unfair dismissals for um, small to medium-sized businesses. Now, if, if that's all you did was just pass an amendment to abolish the old Section 170 CK of the Workplace Relations Act, um, you would have easily got that through. There would have been hardly any talk in the media about it because it seemed like a very, very small change and you would have kept the business community happy but for some reason, Kevin Andrews was convinced, I think partly because he didn't really understand his brief. Kevin Andrews not, has never impressed me in any way. Um, uh, he uh, decided that he would do a complete rewrite of the Act. And so it opened the door to allow the union movements to claim that there was this great big new uh, piece of legislation that was ripping everyone off. And so it was very easy to go out and every time someone lost their job because they were hopeless or they'd stolen or they were incompetent or whatever the case may be, and the union movement could latch onto them, stick them up in the media and say, this person lost their job because of work choices. And it was an, it was a, it was an endless exercise because you could always find someone who, who'd lost their job. But success stories from microeconomic reform take a long time to bear themselves out. You can't just turn around and say, here's you know, chocolate shop maker Joe who, who has improved his profits 20% over the last 10 years because that, that that takes a long time to bleed itself out, right? So they had no good stories to tell for in respect of the legislation. They had only bad stories. And on top of that, you had that imbecile Barnaby Joyce who was running opposition to, to work choices. People forget that. The guy's supposedly a hero now. He was running opposition to work choices. Yeah, he was the, the, the balance of power guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because on the, on the grounds that, um, you know, people were going to be forced to work on Christmas Day. Um, you know, uh, well done, Barnaby. Good on you. you. You destroyed a government, and everyone has completely forgotten about Barnaby's role in that. Just by the by. Mm. I like how you've got a long memory, and you're 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 not a cheerleader at all. You're scathing of anybody. Uh, most people. Most people. Mm. I won't I won't say too much bad about John Howard. He wasn't perfect. Yeah, but... he he was. Well, he 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 was the person who it was. He was he was. This was aligned with his political philosophy. He was an ideologue. He had a certain view. You can't... I mean, it's interesting today, just going on a bit of a tangent, how a lot of the social conservatives say, oh, we've got a great prime minister now, now in uh, Scott Morrison, who's a Christian conservative, but he's a... He terms himself a pragmatic conservative. Uh, he's... I don't... In my opinion, he's, Tim, he's not your friend. <laughs> Tim, Tim, you will not find a more conservative person on the planet than me. I will win any competition with him about conservatism. I quite like Scott. I know him personally, um, but uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call him a, a, an out, a crazy conservative in any way, shape, or form. Mm. Um, you know, um, but I don't dislike him. Yeah, I'll give him an opportunity to do. I'll give him an opportunity to do his job. But hey, you know, I could talk for hours about my dislike for Tony Abbott's uh, government. Um, we could. We could really get into that. <laughs> okay. Now. Well, after the Trade Union Royal Commission, uh, the, the Turnbull government uh, created the Registered Organisation Commission, which was designed yeah. to regulate trade unions in the same way that corporations are regulated by ASIC. But now that's become embroiled in this AFP raid uh, on the offices of the Australian Workers Union, which was investigating whether a donation to get up in 2007 had been properly authorized in the yeah. the minutes and it was um it, it was the the media mm. revealed one of well revealed who they said was the source was one of michaela cash's staffers and now there's this ongoing legal drama in the the federal court uh with mm. the, the aw yeah. and michaela cash which is the the labor party is using to basically discredit the registered organizations commissions to say that it's a politically partisan group and look what michaela cash's office did and this was a politically motivated raid now if you recall do you remember why the um 
why that, that body was set up. It was because Craig Thompson, who at the time was a member, the Labor member for Dobell, had formerly been with the Health Services Union, and he was using the Health Services Union's funds to pay for prostitutes, if you yes. recall. Yes, yes, I remember and, that. And, and, and if you recall, the Labor Party protected him tooth and nail because he, he made up one of the few votes to, that made up their minority government, and they couldn't afford to not have him there. So all of a sudden, um, all, all, the, uh, all the woke warriors um, uh, vanished for political expediency, which uh, doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and, uh, and, and so the scandal that came out of that gave the, the Liberal Party in government a good opportunity to really put unions to accountability. Um, and, and so, you know, but it was, could have been done so much more easily, though, Tim. Um, why didn't they just apply the ASX listing rules to, to all um, organisations? It wasn't hard. All you'd have to do is, is pass the legislation and say ASX listing rules apply. As, uh, what, what more do you need than that? It sounds like they got, uh, they felt like they had political capital from the, the Royal Commission and thought, oh, you know, we've got this dedicated, they wanted to big note themselves, we've got this dedicated new cop, because that's politics. It's not about creating a consistent set of rules. It's about basically saying, look what we did. A Royal Commission that they got so much political capital from that they released a report on New Year's Day. That doesn't that doesn't tell me that that they that they wanted to use whatever capital was coming from that. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that they that they really did feel that they built any capital that came from from the Royal Commission. I think they felt that the Royal Commission was a damp squib. Um, they expected more to come from it. Um, I'm not surprised that more didn't come from it, given the terms of reference. Um, and um, and so they buried it. And I don't think Turnbull was a real believer in in that cause in any event. Um, he's never been, uh, I mean, Malcolm, Malcolm is, a, is, a, is an economic, you know, uh, liberal, if you want to use that term. Um, and by that, I mean that in the best sense of the word liberal, not the worst sense of the word liberal. But, um, but he, he's never been a guy who's had to deal with unions in, in, any, uh, in any way uh, in his business life. Um, he doesn't see them as a threat in the way that people who actually have run small businesses and, and interact with them do. So, you know, I think he just felt, you know, this was a Tony Abbott um, um, uh, uh, shibboleth and it was time to bury it on, on you know, uh, at a convenient time when no one was paying any attention to it. You mentioned uh, Craig Thompson, who he was secretary of the Health Services Union before he went into yeah. parliament in 2007, but he wasn't yeah. the... Uh, they, uh, uh, he wasn't the only one who was taking union members' money in that because uh, Michael Williamson, who was the, the president, he was was uh, using uh, union funds to was pay for school fees and where well, he went to prison. And then the, the whistleblower herself, Kathy Jackson, she turned out to be the biggest embezzler uh, herself. Yeah. And it's fair to say that a few people on the right uh, got sucked into believing, you know, she was a hero when she was basically trying to be the hero so she could cover her own tracks. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. By the way, um, they all do it just to varying degrees. <laughs> um, and the health services union um, became unstuck because one person got caught and the whole card unraveled and then they started blaming each other and, you know, and they all dumped on each other. I can't um, believe that there's all this money lying around for them to embezzle and use. It's, there's, there's, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's like, wow. You, let, me give you, let me give you an example, right? How many people in, Mel in Victoria do you think work in the, for the Victorian government? Oh, it'd probably be close to a million, maybe. Yeah, mm, that's probably going a little far, but let's say let's say it's more like about half a million people, give or take. Yep. Think about half a million people paying even five hundred dollars membership fees a year, which is essentially compulsory. When you like, it may technically be optional, but you know, try try um, try to be a school teacher in a public school system without joining the the, the teachers union. So you just multiply that through. My maths isn't the greatest, but what's that? Twenty-five. Is that twenty-five million dollars? Uh, or two hundred and fifty? I think it's twenty-five million dollars. Yeah. Um, you know, try. Uh, that's a lot of money that they're sitting on. What do they do with it? What do you think they do with it? Hmm. Yes, it's. It just amazes me that there's after they've embezzled so much of it, there's still enough left over for legitimate reasons like union activity. Yeah.
Yeah. By the way, I think my numbers are 250 million. Yeah. So that's five, 500,000 times $500, 250 million. Um, that's a lot of money. So the latest uh, magic bullet that the the coalition government has got to to take down the the union movement more uh, specifically John Setka because he he's now the sacrificial lamb Anthony Albanese wants him expelled from the the Labor Party uh, um, the Supreme Court in Victoria said that it has to be the Victorian uh, state executive that has to expel him and so it's. It, it, it's it's in the works here's expulsion from the but, labor party don't you remember the guy who Setka replaced he replaced a guy called craig johnson who himself was pushed out for because he kept he, if, if memory serves me right right johnson kept going in keen keen cars so he'd, he'd find the bosses on sites and he had a habit he couldn't help it he'd go on he'd go and vandalize their cars so he eventually if memory serves me correct he got convicted of vandalism and he was forced to stand down. But it, it, it's just a game of whack-a-mole, Tim. One, one gets his head cut off, the next one pops up. That's why I refer to him as the sacrificial lamb. They say everything that's wrong with our movement, it's down to, to this one guy. And, you know, look, we're, we're getting rid of him. And so once we've got rid of him, then everything will be sweet, will be totally clean. That's the strategy yeah. here. Yeah, I know that's bullshit. But, yeah, it's, that's, that's why you're clarifying that uh, total BS. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, but that's politics for you. You know, they can say they've done something. Mm. So this new bill is the Ensuring Integrity Bill, which attempts to uh, remove uh, union officials by the registered organisation commission who have who have engaged in unlawful, unethical practices. And Secker is basically well, he knows that this is a somewhat of a threat to him, and so he's he he was revealed to have an expletive written tirade against the the crossbenchers, the Centre Alliance, and and Jackie Lambie, who or uh, uh, Jackie Lambie, she cooked a roast for him down in Tasmania. Yeah, how did he? he, he how, did, how did he pay for his trip to to Tasmania if he's the Victorian State Secretary? How do you mean? He paid for it with union members' funds. Why do you think he paid for it? Mm, uh, for a trip down to Tasmania out of his jurisdiction. Oh, they've always got excuses why they. I need to go there and meet another union official, and uh, yeah, like that stuff's not. That stuff's not shocking. Not yeah, I know. I just thought I'd make the point that he went all the way down to uh, Tasmania to have a have a, a roast with with Jackie Lambie, and yeah. Would, so, would you, would you have loved to have been a fly on the wall at that uh, at that dinner? Um, oh, ja Jackie Lambie, she's what, she's what you call a tough bitch, and so you've got a dinner with a tough bastard and a tough bitch. Yeah, it's, you, you can imagine if you know. I don't know which, yeah, I don't like either of them. Uh, that was, but yeah. yeah not, not get my the, kind of fun. But yeah, get get the the TV cameras in there because I know that Jackie Lambie she's she she's a she's a showwoman and so would have liked to have maybe live streamed that that dinner. Yeah, <laughs> great moments in history lost to us. Exactly, but yes. Uh, uh, Lambie has she's now said that I'll vote for this ensuring integrity bill uh, unless. I, I'll vote it down if John Setka resigns. And so now he, he published an, an ad in the Herald Sun accusing her of, of blackmail. And so this is this escalated this 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 dispute of the the, the toughies, uh, Lambie and, and Setka. And basically Setka in trying to save his political career and his union career, he's basically proving everyone correct about who he really is. Yeah. Yeah, but why do you think he cares? Do you think do you think it, it bothers him if anyone actually thinks that he's um, uh, a thug or a criminal or um, a foul mouth tyrant? Um, well, there is doesn't... usually some concern about, uh, as it's termed these days, my optics. You've got to have some sort of public optics. I mean, Kevin Rudd covered up for a number of years that he was a, a foul mouth uh, bully behind the scenes. But he was looking to get elected to by by people. Um, who who elects Setka? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, democracy in unions is is a is an absolute chimera. Um, there is no real democracy. 
in, in trade union movements. The minute you pop up and try to run for any office, you'll get your head cut off if you're not part of the powers that be. Um, Sekka is untouchable within that. With he, you know, it's like King Jong Un. You basically got to piss off your generals, and they got to come and assassinate you. That's the only way you're ever going to get removed from office. So who does he need to satisfy? Why would you? Why would you walk away from your kingdom um, because Jackie Lamb is giving you a hard time? I wouldn't. And final question, because we're just uh, going on uh, eight o'clock. Uh, will this bill could it could it actually remove John Secker from? his position, or you say the union movement, they're, they're masters at uh, finding loopholes in the legislation. Is this a bit of wishful thinking on the part of uh, what's being proposed by Christian Porter, the Attorney General, this bill? Could could this really be the, the magic bullet, to use the, that phrase? Oh, possibly. Mm. Um, that's probably why he's fighting it tooth and nail. But, um, so what? What's, it, what's long term, what's it going to achieve? Yes, well, it's it's just another, well, I'd say they're seeing the coalition government a politically acceptable opportunity to crack down on union thuggery, which isn't going to be labelled work choices. That's that's how, that's how I see it. You want you want to, you want to change the, the the work workplace culture in Australia? You do two things. You 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 abolish the Fair Work Act completely entirely. You don't leave one word behind. You get rid of it. And, and you empower the police to do their job and crack down on lawlessness. And the minute you do both of those things, um, you, you achieve what you set out to achieve. Um, that's my view. Uh, work choices, how many pages was that legislation? 1,500. Yeah. So basically, you, you could deregulate the entire labour market, say with uh, legislation that's five pages long. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um, why, why, why do you need fifteen hundred pages of regulation? It does it, you know. That's one of the reasons we opposed it back in two thousand and five. Mm. Um, as Ray Evans, um, he's now passed, but as he described it at the time, he called it a a, a Soviet-style re-centralisation of uh, of the uh, of the labour market. Um, in typical Ray style, perhaps that was going a little bit too far, but um, but I understood the sentiment. Well, uh, Carl, this has been a good. I should call it an introductory uh, chat that we've we've had tonight because uh, we've basically established what is the the trade union industrial relations culture in Australia, and you've dropped plenty of red pills about what really goes on, well, not just in the the construction uh, industry, but just in the the union movement as a whole. We didn't even get to uh, talking about uh, what the the HR Nickel Society does, but uh, I'd love to have you back on to to talk a bit more about uh, that and sort of what uh, what well not just that organisation mission is, but also what you know australia needs to basically uh, be competitive in the in the world again because we are basically a rust belt nation now yeah yeah no thanks tim um i'd love to be able to talk with you further in the future and it's been a lot of fun thanks for having me on thank you thanks for tuning in to wilms front visit timwilms.com or rational rise tv to view the archive of episodes and keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.